All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to tonight's Real Estate 101, How to Launch a Successful Real Estate Career. My name is Michael Devlin, I'm a real estate broker. And um, we're gonna talk about three things tonight. Number one is why real estate? If you're, well, let's put it this way. If you're willing to take time off on a Monday to, you know, or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, if you're willing to take time off from your schedule to participate in, well, something like this. It's usually because you're looking for something new, something different, hopefully better in your business or professional career. I'm assuming that's why you're here. And if you're interested in doing something different, well, why would you get into real estate? What would you need to do to be successful? How much money can you really make? Uh, what do agents have to do to be successful? We're gonna talk about that. And then a related topic is why now? So even if it is now a good time to get into real estate is what's going to happen with the market. So we're going to talk about why real estate as in a career or as in a, an added career, a dual career, and why you might be interested in doing that now. Then we're going to talk about how to choose an office to affiliate with, because if you've decided you want to get into real estate, the next question is with whom? There's different kinds of real estate company. They operate and are structured differently. And then we're going to look at some of those differences so you can decide which one's going to work best for you. And then finally, in how to get started, that's where we're going to talk about what do you need to do to get a real estate license, to keep a real estate license, how long does this process take, and uh, well, how much is all of this going to cost? I hope that's what you know. I hope that's what you um, came to hear because that's what I'm going to talk about. So let's start with the segment on why real estate, right? Now, I like to begin with some definition of terms. These are words you may have heard of before. There's the first of all, the words broker and salesperson. Now, the words broker and salesperson refer to two different kinds of real estate licenses. You could get a real estate salesperson's license or you could get a real estate broker's license. Now, in a functional sense, there's not a big difference between the two. And, and what I mean by that is a real estate salesperson can do everything the broker can do with two exceptions, right? If you have a real estate broker's license, there's two things you can do that the salesperson can't do. Number one, you can be independent. Salespeople have to work for brokers, but brokers don't have to work for brokers. Brokers can be independent. The second thing you could do with a broker's license is, well, you could brag about it. You could tell everybody that you've got the advanced license, the graduate license, the executive license, right? The better license, the bigger license. Most people would have no idea what you're talking about, nor do they particularly care. So in order to be a broker, if you're thinking, well, gee, I'd like one of those so I can brag about it. In order to be a broker, you need to have two years full-time experience in real estate or four years part-time experience in real estate, take a bunch of classes, pass an exam, pay a fee, right? So we'll start by talking about, well, how to become a salesperson. Then there's the word agent. When we use the word agent, we're really talking more about a relationship. An agent is somebody who represents a principal, another person, in dealings with third people, other people. So if there is no third person, there is no agency. Now, the way this sometimes comes up is somebody will say to me, you know, if I get my real estate license and then I want to buy a property for myself or my family, can I be my own agent? I've been asked that question many times. And the answer is, well, no, because by definition, agents represent other people. If you're representing yourself in a transaction, you're a principal. And if you're a principal, you can't be an agent. Now, that was an accurate, technically correct answer to the question, but I really know that wasn't the question they were meaning to ask, right? The question they were really asking me was, if I get my real estate license and I want to buy a house, can I save money on the commission? That's really what they were asking, and the answer to that is yes, but it's not because you're acting as an agent in the transaction. You're not. You're a principal, but it's because you're a licensee. And when we use the word licensee, we're referring to somebody with a real estate license, either a broker or a salesperson's license. And as a result of that professional status, you could save money on the commission. Finally, there's the term realtor. 
And the term realtor is a copyrighted designation of the National Association of Realtors, which is a trade association, which is kind of like a union. And it's kind of like, it's like the Teamsters Union. For those of you that aren't aware, the Teamsters Union is a union who you might join if you wanted to be a truck driver. So the question is, do you have to join the Teamsters Union if you want to drive trucks? The answer is no. What do you need if you want to drive trucks? The answer is you need the license, right? You need the commercial driving license. Might you choose to join the union? Some jobs you won't get unless you're a member of the union, plus they have um, training and they have insurance programs and retirement programs. They got stuff that you might find useful. But there's a difference between being a teamster and being a truck driver. The same thing is true in real estate. The law does not require that you join the association of realtors. There's a national association, a state association, and a local board, just like the Teamsters. Right? The law does not require that you join the union. Right? All you need legally to sell real estate is the license. However, if you're going to be seriously selling one to four units of residential property, you might have to join the union. We'll talk a little bit later about that. What can you do if you have a real estate license? Well, first of all, you, and you probably already knew this, you could help people buy and sell residential properties, homes, and get paid a commission. The same is true about commercial real estate. I've been asked many times, I don't, you know, people say, I don't want to go to people's houses. I don't want to work evenings and weekends. I only want to deal with business people during business hours, commercial real estate. That's for me. How do I get a commercial real estate license? And the answer is there's no such thing as a commercial real estate license. There's just a real estate license. And if you have a real estate license, you can do residential sales, you can do commercial sales, and you can do loans. Now, in addition to having the license, your license, you have to take another test and you have to have your license endorsed and you have to take another course and pay another fee. I actually have a class called How to Be a Successful Loan Agent where I go through that process. Property managers need to have a real estate license. It's the same license and people who sell businesses. So in addition to selling the building or the land, we might be selling the business that is on the building and land that also can be done with a real estate license. Out of this group, we're going to focus on residential tonight, right? I also have another class called How to Be a Successful Commercial Real Estate Agent, where I explain what, what that looks like, but not tonight. So if you get a real estate license, there's ways in which you could hold your license. You could either work for a broker or you could not work for a broker but you kind of need to work for a broker. Now, the, the, the reason I have this slide, right, which may not be immediately apparent, is sometimes people say to me, you know, I don't really know what I want to do. I've always been interested in real estate. I like real estate. People say you ought to get into real estate. I got time now, right, you know, sheltering in place and whatever. I got time, you know, to do the studying and thing like that, but I don't know what I want to do. I don't know who I'm going to work for or what I'm going to do. Do I have to figure all that out? Do I have to have a broker know who my broker is before I begin the process? And the answer is no. Anybody can go and qualify and go get a real estate license. And you don't need to have a broker to affiliate with, and you can still get the license. But the license is issued as a non-working license. And a non-working real estate license is like a like a non-working car, right? It's um, you can when people are over at your house, you can show them the car, right? They can even sit in the car, right? But when they say, "Hey, can we go for a ride?" you have to say, "No." You see, it's not it's not a working car. So you can go get a real estate license, and you can keep the real estate license. You can put a copy of it on your wall. You can show it to your friends. But if they say, great, I'd like to buy a house. Can you help me? The answer is no. No, I can't. It's not a working license. In order for you to have a working license, you need to be sponsored by a broker. But you can get a license, and you can renew the license, and you can keep it forever There's, without having a broker. Not sure why, but you could. Why are people attracted to real estate? Freedom and independence is one of the big reasons that I hear. 
Many years ago, I used to work for a very odd company. They were strange. I, I always thought they were very strange. And what was weird about them is they told everyone what time you had to start work each day. It was like they had some sort of a rule. Everybody has to begin at a particular time. And then they let you know when you could go on a break and when was lunch and when lunch was over. And at the end of the day, when you could go home. I believe that arrangement is called a job, right? I think that J-O-B, right? The journey of the book. Being in real estate is not like having a job. It's much more like having your own business. And the people that are most successful in real estate are people that have always wanted to have their own business. And it wouldn't hurt to have some business acumen, right? Understand about how a business is run. You understand what I'm saying? You don't punch a time clock. We're not gonna call you at 10 o'clock in the morning and say, hey, where are you? What's going on, right? It's not that kind of an arrangement. And the relationship that we have with our associates is more like a business consultant or a business advisor to a business owner than it is an employer-employee relationship. By the way, this can be one of the biggest disadvantages to being in real estate. Because freedom is a gift not always wisely used. You know, there was a story of the guy that joined the tech company on his first day, and they were giving him the tours and everything. And at lunch, he meets somebody who's been there for, it seems like, forever, it sounds like. And that guy's telling him what's going on and where they've been and where they're going. And so finally, the newbie asks the old timer, so that's interesting. How long have you worked here? And the old timer says, ever since they threatened to fire me. That's how long I've been working here. Have you ever met people like that? Where the people that work just enough so they don't get fired, right? And then the company usually pays them just enough so they don't quit, right? They work out this sort of sick relationship, you know? Well, being in real estate, that isn't going to work in real estate because, well, I'm gonna say it plainly. Real estate is a non-salaried, commission-only profession non-salary commission only. It can be a high paying hard job, but it can also be a very low paying easy job. Speaking of financial rewards, how much money can you make in real estate? Um, and I've been asked if you could work at more than one company. If you're a real estate salesperson, you can only work for one broker. Right? Real estate salespeople can only work for one broker at one time, one company. Financial rewards. How much money can you make if you sell real estate? Well, let, let me give you an example. Right? Let's say you participated in the sale of an $800,000 property. Now, the amount of commission that's paid is not chiseled in stone. It's not set by law. It can be negotiated. It can vary. But, and there's two sides to every transaction. There's a buying side and the selling side. So the commission is usually split between the two sides. But let's just say you represented a buyer and the buyer was buying an $800,000 property. A typical commission would be about $20,000 representing one side on an $800,000 sale. So what that means is that if you were in one year to find six people who wanted to sell an $800,000 home and six people who wanted to buy an $800,000 home and they all bought, sold, at the end of that year, you would have received $240,000 in gross commission income, $240,000. So I guess one of the questions is, you know, could you live on that? I know you'd have to cut back a little. An average sale in our market of a million dollars, for example, and I'm in um, Silicon Valley in Santa Clara County last month, the, the median price of a single family home is about 1.3, right? Just, just saying. But if you sold a million dollar property, the average commission might be $25,000. And if you did 12 of those in a year, that would be $300,000 in gross commission income. What would you possibly do with that money? I mean, really, what could you do with all that money? One of the things you might do is invest in real estate. In fact, I'm gonna talk about investors as real estate agents, but there's an old saying, buy land, they ain't making any more of it. 
And most people that retire with money and are well off usually are doing that. The typical person is doing that through real estate investments. And if you want to invest in real estate, being in real estate is maybe a really good place to be. You see properties when they first come on the market before other people get a chance to look at them. You know more about financing options and whether the market is going up and down, right? If you are going to invest in real estate, being in real estate is a good place to be to do that. And then there's the, there's security. Now, that may seem odd for an independent contractor, have your own business kind of an arrangement, but I'll give you an example. A friend of mine went to San Jose State, studied mechanical engineering, graduated, went to work for Hitachi, hard drive division, was there for 28 and a half years, and they laid him off. They said nothing personal, right? There was nothing personal. And he didn't think it was personal because they laid off his whole department, the division, they shut down the whole plant. Now, I'm not saying he was a perfect engineer, but even if he had been a perfect engineer, he still would have been laid off. Because it wasn't that they decided that he wasn't doing a good job. They decided we don't need anybody here doing that job anymore. So real estate, because it's more like having your own business and you're an independent contractor, you can fail at it. You can be bad at it, but you can't really get fired. Right. You understand if you don't get along with us, you can take your license and go down the street and work for somebody else. If you don't get along with anybody, just tough it out for two years and then you can go get your broker's license and you can work alone. Although there's some downside to that as well. Do you understand what I mean about security? Nobody's going to put you out of business but you. Right? You can fail, but you can't get fired. So ways of approaching real estate. There's the unlicensed finder, a referral only agent, the investor agent, dual career or part-time agent, full-time agents, and big time agents. Let's take a look at what those are. The first one is an unlicensed finder. So let's you don't have a, let's say you don't have a real estate license. You're maybe in the process of getting your real estate license and you find out that somebody that you know or somebody you run across is interested in buying, selling, or investing in real estate. If you introduce those people to, well, somebody like me, you could earn a finder's fee. Now, because you don't have a license, you're not going to take part in any of the negotiations. You're not involved in the discussion of the price and the terms and other conditions, but you can solicit people for referrals and you can find and introduce people and you can be paid a finder's fee. A referral only agent is somebody who's gotten their real estate license, but for other reasons, they do not want to join the Association of Realtors, the union or the multiple listing service. And they do that because they wanna save money. I'll talk about what that means later. So, by not joining the Board of Realtors or the MLS, what they can do is refer people to agents that could pay them a referral fee. The referral fee is higher than the finder's fee. And because you actually have a real estate license at that point, you can be involved in the transaction. Sometimes what people do is they, they're a finder or a referral only agent. This is if they're tight on the money to get into real estate, the investment, there'll be a finder or a referral only agent in order to get the money to join the board of realtors and to take off. So if you're um, an investor agent, let me just do this before we go on, or a dual career agent, that may be, that's the part-time agent, that may be more, more obvious. So the investor agent is somebody who usually has another job, oftentimes it's in tech, um, sometimes it's just a family, but that's another job. And they want really their goal is to be a real estate investor. And so they get their real estate license to help them as an investor, right? That's, that's a form of part-time. Dual career or part-time are two types of people, either those who want out of their current job because they just do, right? They've had it, they've been there long enough, they would like to transition into real estate. And then there are some people that are permanent part-time. 
in that where they work is where they meet everybody. I, I got a guy that works at, at Facebook. He doesn't want to leave. That's where he meets everybody that he's helping buy or sell real estate. He doesn't want to quit. He gets a, you know, there's benefits and a salary. You get the idea. Um, full time means that you're able to devote 40 hours a week or so. And if you're doing it full time, which means you don't have any other source of income, there are some challenges, which I just want to discuss. The first one is you need to know that this is sales, professional sales. Now, what is sales? And the answer is at its heart, at its essence, it involves talking to people. The more people you talk to, the more you're going to get paid. If you talk to some people about real estate, then you'd get paid some. But if you talk to a lot of people about real estate, then you could get paid a lot. It's a function of how many people you talk to. So who do you talk to? Well, you start by talking to the people you know, because you know them. We know that about 40% of all real estate transactions, when they track back, how did the buyer and the seller find the agent? 40% of the time they say, I was either the person was a friend, family, coworker, or I was referred to them by a friend, family, or coworker. You start by talking to the people you know. But if you're serious about making money in real estate, you're probably going to have to talk to people you don't know. Because you may not know enough people just to talk to them and to make a career out of that. And who do you talk to and what do you say? That's something that we cover in our training programs. You, if this is what you're going to be living on, um, then six months worth of reserves might be needed. I've had an agent start in June and do an open house and meet somebody at the open house and they bought the house and in July they got their first commission check, 30 days or so from when they officially started in real estate. That's possible, but not normal. You understand if you had your license today and somebody said, I'd like to buy a house, help me buy a house. It's going to take a little while for them to talk to the lender and get pre-approved and for you to figure out their wants and needs and to start showing them homes and to find the right home. And then when they made an offer and the offer has been accepted, it's going to take probably 30 days for it to close. Yeah, you understand there could be several months before you actually start getting your first check. In residential real estate, you have to be willing to work evenings and weekends. That's when your clients usually are available, which is also why you could do this part time, right? Do a career because when they're free is when you're free and when they generally would like to talk to you. You have to be a self starter. There are some people that don't work unless somebody is watching them, right? This isn't the career. You have to be organized. You have to be a self starter. You have to have discipline. I've already mentioned that there's no salary. Um, and if you're doing real estate full time, joining the board of realtors, doing all that, it could be fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars in startup capital just to get going. I'll explain that in more detail later. What do you need to succeed? A goal would be nice. A plan, a schedule, training, for example, would help in learning how to implement the plan, coaching, mentoring, and the right tools and systems. I'll give you an example. Let's say you're a full-time agent and you like my idea of 12 transactions. You, you like that idea, right? $240,000, $300,000 in gross commission income. So the question is for us to close 12 transactions, how many appointments are we going to need with buyers or sellers or investors? Well, your mileage may vary. And in our mentoring program, we'll be there to help you. That'll increase your percentage. But let's be conservative and say you need four appointments before one person buys, sells, or invests. Four appointments before you find a client that actually does something. So if you want to close 12 transactions, you would need 48 appointments, which comes down to one appointment a week for 48 weeks, right? You can take a month off. You're in real estate. Take a month off. One appointment a week. 48 weeks, that's the number of appointments you would need. Okay, how do I get an appointment? Well, the answer is you have to have conversations with people about buying, selling, or investing in real estate. How many? Well, 
again, your mileage may vary, but a good rule of thumb is 50 conversations produce an appointment. Now, over let me, so what would that mean? If I talk to 10 people a day, on average, five days a week, I would have talked to 50 people a week, which would produce oh, an appointment a week, which would produce a transaction a month, which means I, I could go shop for a new Tesla. Right? Isn't that what that means? So who do you talk to and what do you say and how do you do appointments? That's something that we cover in our training and the coaching and the mentoring program, plus the tools that you need to do that. What do real estate agents do all day? Well, this one is broken down as many of them are by in time slots, but that's not really, the, it, it's hard to stick to the plan. So when we talk about lead generation, when you hear real estate agents or other salespeople talk about lead generation, my definition of lead generation is activities that would lead to an appointment, right? If what you're doing could create an appointment, you're doing lead generation, which requires some preparation and some time devoted to actually doing it, talking to people in your sphere of influence, in a geographic area, expired listings, for sale by listings. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different ways in which you could talk to people. You also have to service the business. We get like, text messages and emails and phone calls and reports that need to be run and all that. Lead conversion means following up with the people that you've already talked to in the past. We know that about 70% of real estate transactions come not from the initial contact, but from following up with the people you've talked to in the past. And then there's time where you're actually showing property or going on listing appointments. That's sort of a breakdown. So is what's happening in real estate? What's going to happen in... Um, home values in 2021 well as in many things it's a question of supply and demand according to the national association of realtors we you may have heard this we have a shortage of inventory there were approximately 370,000 fewer homes for sale um, at the end of the year than there were in previous years the number of properties being sold is down so supply has been a limiting factor However, there is some reason that that might ease. Two reasons. One, because um, as the health, a lot of the reasons that people say they're not selling their homes is because they're worried about COVID, they're worried about what they're doing, they're, 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 they're concerned with the pandemic. So as more of that comes under control, more people are going to be interested in putting their homes on the market. Also, there's a financial reason why some people might feel forced to sell. How about demand? Interest rates are really low. They went up again, they went up recently, but they're still really, really low. Um, at the end of, at the beginning of 2020, they were three points, three and, and three quarters percent. Right now it's under 3%. Um, there is a big drop in interest rates. And the reason that people are so focused on buying homes right now is because interest rates are at historic lows. If interest rates go up 1%, right? Interest rates go up 1%, it reduces the purchasing power of a buyer by about 10%. So the real estate analysts forecast that home sales are gonna to continue to appreciate in 21, but at a slower pace. How much is our values likely to appreciate in 2021? It depends on who you listen to. The National Association of Realtors and Zellman Associates and Realtor.com see almost a 6%. Freddie Mac, that's a government-sponsored entity that buys mortgages, and CoreLogic is a big data company, and Fannie Mae is a friend of Freddie Mac. And MBA is the Mortgage Bankers Association, not the other MBA. And they believe between 2 and maybe 3% will be the appreciation. And of course, that could vary a lot by market. Average is almost 4% for 2021. The reality is we don't really know, right? We don't really know. Um, are there going to be a tsunami? I've seen that phrase a lot in the media of foreclosures because mortgage forbearance may be ending. Well, that may be true or not, right? That forbearance is going to be ending. 
but what if it did? Well, one of the one of the issues is uh, where people are in the forbearance. You can see that a third, almost uh, more than a third, 39.1% of all forbearance loans are now 150 plus days behind. And as many in one in four, 25% are six months behind. So there are a lot of properties in mortgage forbearance that might be extended, but that could cause some pressure on people because at some point it's got to end. At some point it has to. So will that lead to a tsunami? Well, Michael Sklarz of Collateral Analytics say, we may very well see a meaningful increase in the number of homes listed for sale as these borrowers choose to sell at what is arguably an intermediate top in the market and downsize to something more affordable. Is there going to be a wave of foreclosures like there was in 2008 and 2009? Probably not. And one of the big differences between now and then it's back then there wasn't very much equity, but now most of the people have a lot of equity in their property. So if they, as it says here from Odetta Cushy, with enough equity, a homeowner has the option of selling their home or tapping into their equity through a refinance to weather an economic shock. It is a lack of sufficient equity, the second component of the dual trigger, that causes seriously serious delinquencies to become a foreclosure. What that's saying is people don't have to let their property go into foreclosure. Right? If they're having trouble paying their mortgage, they have enough equity by and large that they could sell the property, pay off their loan, and have cash in the bank, which means less foreclosures. However, that might increase a little bit the amount of inventory that we have. But is that going to cause a, a bubble to pop in real estate? Probably not. Um, it would just mean more properties for sale. And right now we could use a lot more properties for sale. Think of throwing peanuts at a, at a hungry elephant. Um, it takes a lot of peanuts and we're, we're behind right now. Let's move into how to pick an office. And as a general concept, there are offices that the, the traditional office, the higher the commission that they pay you, the fewer the services would be. And uh, some offices charge monthly fees. Let's talk about that. Now, there are many variations of this, but speaking generally, there's three kinds of real estate offices. There's the independent, the national franchise, and a cloud-based broker. So I work with, I'm affiliated with an independent called Real Estate Solutions. Uh, it's an independent. And like many independents, the advantages are there's no monthly fees, right? To work at the office, right? If you join the Board of Realtors and the multiple listing service, there's a fee for that I'll cover later. No monthly fees, no technology, right? Websites and things like that already pre-designed for you. The commission split will be higher, but there's no cap. I'll talk about what the cat means. Training by the office, I provide training for agents at Real Estate Solutions. However, there's um, that's pretty much it, other than that which you could get from the multiple listing service or the Board of Revenue. No revenue or profit sharing or stock options, but there's a lot of flexibility. You can do commercial real estate, you can do loans. This is an option that is best for the part-time referral agent, the investor agents, let's just say those who do not want to pay monthly fees. In my background, I worked for a ridiculously long time for a company called Century 21. I was the director of training and recruiting for Century 21 of Northern California. I was the vice president of the largest Century 21 group in Northern California. And I also spent seven years at a company called Keller Williams, which is now one of the biggest residential companies in the United States. Um, companies like that have larger monthly fees. Right? They have monthly fees. So typical Keller Williams could cost you $200 to $300 a month. It varies. The commission splits are lower, and they oftentimes at Keller Williams have a cap. And what a cap means is once you pay the company a certain amount of money, it stops for that year. You get what's called 100% of the commissions after you capped. 
right? At some of the offices, it was 35, some 45, some $55,000. So for example, I'll give you an example later when we get to the, the cloud. They have training, all of the big franchises have training, but it's sort of mid-level. It's like a 30-day program, you're done, good, go. That's pretty much it. Some profit share at Keller Williams, I'm uh, in the top 1% of lifetime Keller Williams profit share earners, it's not very much money. Um, no stock options, they're not very flexible. They're, you know, a big national company, not very flexible. And that may be best for agents who feel the need for brick and mortar buildings, right? They want a brick and mortar, old school, I wanna go and sit in an office every day. Although we're not really doing that because, you know, there's a virus. I also work with a company called EXP Realty. And EXP Realty is a cloud-based brokerage. Lower monthly fees, $85 a month, right, is the fee to join and that includes training and lots of technology, much higher level of technology, websites, customer relationship management programs, landing pages, things like that. The commission split is higher. So, for example, in Keller Williams, the base commission would be 70-30, right? And then you could work your way up. Um, but at EXP, the base commission is 80-20. It's a higher split. And whereas at uh, Keller Williams, it would cap around 35,000 or something like that. It's only 16,000 at EXP. They pay you more money and you get to 100% faster more training, more than 50 hours a week of different kinds of training, training on everything. There's revenue share, half of all the money that EXP gets, they give back to the associates. You can also get stock options. They have more options than the national franchise. If you're comfortable working in the cloud and you have big goals, EXP would be the one to work for. Now, who's worth more? Airbnb or Hilton Hotels. Hilton Hotels has lots of locations internationally. Airbnb doesn't own any buildings in that sense, right? They don't own rooms. The market capitalization, which is the value of the stocks, and this was from early in January because this, these things change, um, for Hilton Hotels was 30.87 billion. However, the market capitalization for the cloud-based alternative, right, which is Airbnb, is 88.25 billion. So almost three times as much. Airbnb is worth almost three times as much as Hilton Hotels. To give a real estate perspective, there's a company called Rheology. Now that may not be a household name, right? You may not have ever heard that name before, but you've heard the names of the brands they own. They own Coldwell Banker and Century 21 and Better Homes and Gardens and Sotheby's and Coldwell Banker Commercial and ERA and Cochrane Group and Cardis is a national relocation company and TRG is a group of title companies and NRT is the National Realty Trust which owns Klein Realty and Zip Realty and, and a bunch of other places. What is the value of the company that has all those brands? And the answer is it's 1.51 billion. How about Remax? Now Remax and Keller Williams both claim to be the biggest real estate company in the world, biggest in the United States. We don't know what Keller Williams market capitalization is because it's a privately held company. We just don't know. Gary Keller knows maybe, but we don't know. But Remax, this is from their website, has 120,000 agents in more than 100 countries and territories. Their market capitalization is 674.18 million. Not, remember, the other one was billion. This is million. How about EXP? EXP is a cloud-based company. And one of the reasons that EXP can pay better and then provide more services and give agents back more money is because, well, they're not renting buildings all over the United States or the world. They're, they don't have the brick and mortar. So there's EXP Commercial, and this is called EXP World Holdings. You can Google search it. Verbella is a collaboration virtual marketplace. Express Offers is called iBuyer. The market capitalization of EXP, the cloud-based brokerage, is $4.42 billion. 
So to recap, rheology, remember that Century 21, Cobalt Banker, Cobalt Banker Commercial, Sotheby's, ERA, Better Homes and Gardens, and all of those, that their market is 1.1.5 billion. Remax is under 700 million. And EXP is worth, I don't know, three times as much as the as rheology. And it's because it's a cloud-based company. So of these three, which one would you like to have stock options in? Um, I'm going with EXP World Holdings. The growth has been dramatic. We ended the year with 40,000 agents. You can see um, our, our growth is going up and it shot up a lot because when COVID hit, we were the only major cloud-based real estate company. All the other real estate companies were scrambling to figure out what we were gonna do, you know, but you know, um, we didn't have to figure out how you operate from the cloud, we already were. We were um, listed as one of the best places to work in 2021. Um, by Glassdoor, and we are an international company expanding our footprint. You can see we're in Mexico and Canada, United States, of course, Puerto Rico, Brazil, South Africa, Portugal, Italy, France, United Kingdom, India, Hong Kong, Australia, and growing, right? And we're adding more companies. We're in a expansion mode. And we ended the year with phenomenal growth, the most profitable, at the end of 2020, 40,000 agents. We've acquired some other technology companies, established a commercial real estate division in all 50 states. Did I mention I have a, a, a seminar on how to start a commercial real estate career? And um, we are expanded into five other com countries back in 2020. So how important is the name of the company that you work for? Every year, the National Association of Realtors, this is the 2020 profile of home buyers and sellers. First of all, they asked buyers, how did you find your real estate agent? You'll notice that 40% of the time, that 40% of the time they found their agent by referred by or is a friend, neighbor, or relative. 13% of the time they had used the agent before. So when you add those two together, 53% are repeat and referral business. You can get an idea. Personal contact by the agent, calling on the phone, knocking on their door, that was only 4% of the time. Um, if we were looking at, how about that? What is important to buyers, right? Why does a buyer want to work with one agent over another agent? You can see trustworthy and honest is the number one, um, agent's experience, reputation, friend or family member, 13% of the time. But the part I wanted to call your attention to was, does association with a particular firm mean that somebody's going to want to work with you as an agent? And the answer is no. Like only 1% of the time would a buyer say that they wanted to work with an agent because there was a particular firm. I've never actually met a buyer that felt that way. Personally, if you were a seller, how would you find your real estate agent? 41% of the time, it was a referral from a family, friend, or coworker. 26% of the time, it was repeat business. So that's like um, 67, almost 70% of sellers are referral or repeat business. Personal contact by the agent was only 4% of the time. You have as much chance of getting a, a transaction from a referral as you might from door knocking or that sort of thing. It's not saying you can't do that, but right now we can. What's important to sellers? Well, maybe sellers care about the name of the company that you work for. Maybe sellers do. How many sellers, what percent of sellers said that association with a particular firm was important? Well, it was only 1%. Um, and if you think about it, people don't do business with real estate companies, they do business with real estate agents. Um, in that sense, it doesn't matter if your company is a household name or not, it's more about you. How to get started. There are three things you need to do to get a real estate license, three phases. First, you have to complete three college level courses in real estate. You don't have to go to college, they're all included in part of our program. 
Second, you have to pass a test given by the California Department of Real Estate. Those are two separate things. And then once you pass the test, completed the three college courses, you can now apply to get a license. Before you can take the state exam, you have to complete a college level course in real estate principles, a college level course in real estate practices, and an elective course. The elective can come from anything on this list. Now, I will point out that on this list is accounting, economics, and business law. Accounting, economics, and business law. What that means is, is that if you have ever taken accounting, economics, or business law from a junior college or better, you have the third course. Now, I've had people say, well, I've got all three. Is that going to help me? Not for this, because you need principles and practice and then one from this list. If you're saying, well, I don't have any of those accounting, economics, or business law, what am I going to do? The legal aspects of real estate is included in our course package. And by the way, even if you've got accounting, economics, or business law, you might want to go through real estate law because you're far more likely to get questions about real estate law than well, accounting on the state licensing exam. So how can you complete these college level courses? Our system involves an online course. And the way an online course works is you enroll in the course. You enroll in the course. Um, and then once you start the course, there is like a timer that starts ticking. And then in 18 days from the day you begin the course, you become eligible to take the final exam for that course. You don't have to take the final exam in 18 days. The point is you can't take it any sooner than 18 days after you enroll. All right. The final exams for the college level courses are online final exams. You can take the test at home and it's an open book test. Let me cover that one more time. The three final exams for the three college level courses are online, at home, open book, cheat as much as you want to final exams. You can cheat as much as you want to. They give you three hours to get 75 out of 100 questions right. Can you, did I mention that this is an open book test? The reason they make you wait 18 days to take it is because you could pass tonight. We give you the book and internet connection and let, leave you alone for three hours. You're going to be able to find 75 answers just by looking them up in the book or looking them up online. And that would make the whole thing seem kind of ridiculous. So they make you wait 18 days before you can take the final exam. I hope you understand that completing the three college level courses is not the hard part of getting a real estate license. Right? Not the hard part. What is the hard part? Well, then you have to go take the state exam. The state exam is not an online test. In fact, at the moment I'm speaking, they're not giving the exam because, well, there's a virus. Uh, they were, they were, they weren't, they were, they're not. They soon will be. Some of the other tests, like to take the mortgage loan originator exam is being done online. The Department of Real Estate hasn't gotten there yet, which means when they do give the tests, they're giving them in their five locations, Oakland, Sacramento, Fresno, Orange County, and San Diego. That's it. Right? That's where they give the test. It's not an open book test. right? You're not allowed to cheat. They're watching you. The state exam is 150 multiple guess, I mean multiple choice questions. You know, A, B, C, D, pick the best answer. There's no essay questions, no fill in the blanks, no true false. Out of the 150 questions, you have to get 105 right or 70% in order to pass. Does that seem like a particularly high score to require? 70%? You are laying on, your op on the operating table and your brain surgeon says, look, I may be new, but don't worry, I passed the brain surgeon's exam. I got 70% of those questions right. I nailed that test. That doesn't sound very good. 70%? I mean, really? Right? If, if your brain surgeon got 70% on the brain surgeon's exam, it means that they missed more than one out of every four questions 
they were asked about the subject of brain surgery, that doesn't sound very good. So my point with all of that is you don't have to be a brain surgeon in order to get a real estate license. You don't have to be a brain surgeon to get a real estate license. All you have to do is get 70% of the questions right and you're in. Having said that, however, every time the Department of Real Estate gives this exam, they fail more than 50% of the people that are in the room. And many of those people, they have failed before. You can take this test an unlimited number of times. I've met people that have failed it more than 10 times. Right? They decided maybe they ought to get a course. I don't know, you don't want to rush a decision like that. So of these people that are failing, Every time they give the test, they fail more than half. First time takers, more than 60% of them fail on the first try. Of all these people that are failing, how many of them do you suppose were able to successfully complete those three online open book, cheat as much as you want to college level courses? And the answer is, well, they all didn't, right? You can't even take the state exam if you haven't done the three college level courses. My point is, Doing the three college courses does not mean you're getting a real estate license. It just means you've done the minimum amount that the law requires to go take a shot at the exam. What I do is I teach people how to pass the test. In addition to the program giving you the college courses you need, I have live classes. They're on Wednesday nights from 6.30 to 8.45, broadcast on the internet and recorded. They're in a rotating schedule, which means it virtually never ends. You know, and it's like a pizza. They're warm and cheesy. It's like a pizza in that there's no first slice to a pizza, and I don't have a first class either. All of the classes are taught as independent modules. They don't build on each other. You could start at any one in the cycle. You could take them if you wanted to in any order. You can repeat them as often as you can stand it. The investment in the program is $398. You get the 12 live classes, the video replays, a course outline, a practice testing program. You get that includes the three college courses that you need, and there's a cram class. Um, I call it an exam workshop, which is held on a Saturday before your test. Why my website and my program is called DRE Class. That's either for Devlin Real Estate or Department of Real Estate, whatever, whatever works for you. I have a very high pass rate. Virtually everyone who goes through my pro program passes the exam on their first try. I encourage you to come and sit through a class as my guest so you can see, you know, if you like it or not. And when you're done, I have a placement program to help you affiliate with whatever kind of office is going to work best for you. If you join my team on your first closing, I'll rebate the $398 that you paid to get a license all right, um, to go through my program. That will be a tuition rebate on your first closing. How long is it going to take to get a license? If in normal times, and I, I hope you realize these are not normal times, in normal times, the minimum amount of time it would take to get a real estate license is four months. Right now, I would count on six months, right? at least because we're well, waiting. There's a virus and they've stopped giving the tests for a little while, right? They are eventually going to work that out. But it's going to, I would, I would believe it would take at least six months to get licensed, even if you started right away. I also have an apprentice program for people that are in the licensing process. You can join some of the coaching and training sessions I do on how to fill out a purchase contract and listing agreements and marketing property and things like that. EXP World, which is our cloud campus where there's live classes and things like that. I'll get you a guest pass, guidance on what you could be doing now so that you could get future real estate business and you could be a finder. Right, uh, find somebody that would be interested in buying, selling, or investing and get a finder's fee. What does it cost to start a real estate career? So the college level courses license preparation is $398. It's gonna cost $305 to take the state exam and get the Department of Real Estate to issue you a license. And there's fingerprints that need to be taken and the processing fee, that's about $75. $778 gets you licensed. Now, if you're going to be a referral only agent or even an investor agent, that you might stop right there. 
But if you're going to be serious about selling real estate and you're going to, you want to list homes and you want to go more than just referring people, then that brings up the Association of Realtors and the Multiple Listing Service. The annual, these are annual numbers. To be a member of the Association of Realtors, $675. And that's the one I'm a member of. They're, the, they don't vary that much in price. $845 a year for the multiple listing service. I should mention at this point, however, our average commission for an agent exceeds $20,000. Just thought I would throw that out. Exceeds $20,000. Your license is good for four years. Every four years, you have to take 45 hours of continuing education to renew it, pay another fee. Um, if you want to contact us, there's, um, there's a way to do it. Uh, you can email, you can call, set up an appointment. If you have special questions, where you'd like to talk to me directly, just reach out to us. We'll set it, send you a calendar link and you can schedule a time and I'll answer your questions specifically. I have really good Yelp reviews, mostly five star. I have gotten a four star review. Um, if you would like to know, well, what could I do next? You go to my website, dreclass.com. There's a button that says free guest lesson, click on that. Actually, it looks a little bigger now. Um, free guest lesson, and then you, you know, you take a class. You fill out a form that looks like this. If you're saying, I don't need a free guest lesson, I'm all ready to get signed up. How do I do that? Go to my website, click on sign up now. Click on sign up now. It's $398 for the whole package, and you fill out a form that looks a lot like the one you did to come to this session. I can see we're up to about 7.30, our appointed hour. If you've got further questions, reach out to us. You're gonna get a follow-up email, um, set up an appointment, talk to me. I'll be happy to talk to you on the phone, Google Meet, Zoom, we got all those things. And I'd be happy to answer any other questions that you might have. Thanks for coming. I appreciate your participation tonight. Um, just uh, be safe out there, and I look forward to see you in class soon.